Allora, è un grande piacere eh, per me per primo per tutto il Dipartimento avere qua oggi Fulvio Ricci che è da, della Scuola Normale Superiore e Fulvio è nato a Savona, non dico l'anno, no? okay, però lo so, no. e si è laureato a Pisa ed è stato allievo della Scuola Normale Superiore, ha preso il dottorato in Maryland ed è stato prima eh, professore al Politecnico di Torino e poi alla Scuola Normale Superiore dal 2000. È eh, sia socio dell'Accademia delle Scienze di Torino dal 1998 e socio dell'Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei. Non sono nato da quando? 99. 99. Okay. E Fulvio, al, prima di venire qua, ho guardato su Mazzenet, ha pubblicato 98 articoli ad oggi. 1370 citazioni ed ha pubblicato su Invenzione, Sannas of Mathematics, American Journal of Mathematics, Crells, Advances in Mathematics, eccetera, eccetera. E io ho collaborato negli ultimi anni, nel sei anni ormai con Fulvio per questioni di print, quando ci fu l'anno in cui si potevano fare pochissime no? domande, allora abbiamo, abbiamo fatto questo, questo print di cui lui è il coordinatore nazionale insieme e è stata una bellissima esperienza, è una persona con cui si lavora perfettamente, mai avuto una discussione, è gentilissimo, sempre pronto ad ascoltare, a collaborare, a proporre iniziative e insomma, quindi sono veramente contento di avere oggi Fulvio qua e che ci parlerà di aspetti dell'analisi sferica su spazi omogenei e commutativi a crescita con il mondo. Allora in italiano grazie per questa introduzione e ti voglio assicurare che, che così le tue espressioni di apprezzamento sono, sono reciproche. Ok, and uh, I'm very glad to be here and uh, grateful to Filippo for this invitation. And um, I will uh, so the topic of my of my talk, which will be, I mean, this is a call for the stair. Per andare avanti sulla tastiera. Ah, sulla tastiera. So, uh, so this, so this will be a, as, uh, uh, Untechnical as possible, um, <coughs> for a rather wide audience, and uh, and uh, so I want uh, to present a, a, a general problem on which I've been working for. Uh, well, I, I realized when I wrote the slide that so it's almost ten years, and um, but uh, one gets slow, slow as as gets fast. So, um, and uh, with the various collaborators, here are the names of the collaborators. And, uh, so, the, um, this, the commutative uh, homogeneous spaces that are in the title are a rather classical object in uh, non-commutative harmonic analysis and, and uh, differential geometry also. And uh, they've been introduced uh, uh, for uh, analysis on, uh, on uh, semi-simple groups and symmetric spaces. And so Gelfan, Goldman, Arjichandra, there are also others. And, uh, um, so But my interest is, uh, is primarily of an uh, analytic nature. So, um, and, uh, and uh, is, uh, is about methods of harmonic analysis for uh, understanding operators on, uh, <coughs> on, uh, on such manifolds, um, which commute with the action we will see there is a group. So, um, so I will I will give some definition that to many of you will be, uh, will be familiar, uh, many or some of you will be familiar. And, uh, 
And here is a reference for, uh, for the kind of talks, at least mostly for the geometric and classification part of what I say. And this is a book of John Wolf. Um, so, and the, the, some of the things I will say are related, but uh, with a different kind of approach to work by other people mostly Charles Benson and Gay Radcliffe and uh, the collaborators like uh, Joe Jenkins and uh, Ronald Lipsman. And, uh, and I want to mention three papers which uh, have been uh, the origin of this problem. And uh, each of them uh, is uh, um, uh, <coughs> concerns results in different areas. The first about uh, um, this is analysis on, uh, on the Heisenberg group. Uh, the second is a topological uh, uh, point that I will explain during my talk. And the last one is, um, is a purely algebraic classification of all the manifolds, of all these uh, commutative manifolds. And, uh, well, uh, there are two expressions which refer to the same object. You can see them in the first and second line. Commutative space is an expression that uh, focuses on, on the up, on the main. And, uh, and there is the terminology Gelfan pair, which more uh, refers to the algebraic structure of the groups that are involved. But, but uh, they are equivalent. equivalent. So, uh, to begin with, is it possible to move this to the to the table? Because otherwise, I have to move back and forth. Okay. <coughs> I guess they. Forced to move um, So, let me start with the smooth manifold, which will always be connected. And, uh, and then there is a group, the Lie group G, which um, acts on it. So, there is a, a, so, each element of the group must be thought of as a transformation of the manifold a diffeomorphism of the manifold M, and the group acts transitively. So each point can be mapped to any other point. So that's what that's the reason for the expression homogeneous. Um, some uh, hypothesis, uh, one, a very important one, is that, uh, is that the stabilizer of any point, so the group of elements that fix the point is compact. And the other is that uh, G is second countable. <coughs> Not so. So, uh, but these hypotheses are sufficient to guarantee that uh, we have a G invariant Borel measure on the, on the manifold. And this is unique up to scalar multiples like the hard measure on the, on the locally compact group. And uh, uh, if we fix a base point, x0, and, and that at certain point we will have this fixed point, which it doesn't matter which you have chosen, but it must be fixed. And then, um, and then but fix this point, then, uh, uh, the quotient, the G modulo, the stabilizer of this point is uh, uh, diffeomorphic to, to the manifold. Okay, these are technical conditions. And uh, uh, homogeneous, one, one of the possible way, of the, and the simplest way at this stage of defining what does it mean that the manifold M is commutative is to say that if you take the, the Algebra of, of differential operators on the manifold which commute with group actions uh, is commutative. It's a commutative algebra. 
And this means that, in a way, indicates that you have a rather large group uh, of uh, um, a large number of transformations. The, the group G is large enough uh, to make the algebra of the equivalent operator rather small, uh, so small to be commuted. And so some mm, elementary examples, of course, the first of all is Rn, and you just take the translation. Okay. In this case, the stabilizer is just is the origin. Or you can take Rn as a manifold, but as a group, you add to the translations, so that Rn stands for the translation, also the rotations, orthogonal transformations. Okay. So here we have a larger group, which is called the Euclidean motion group, but the manifold is the same. So uh, the same manifold can be homogeneous with respect. So it can be, with a, can be homogeneous, uh, homogeneous manifold with respect to the different things. And then uh, uh, the unit sphere in uh, Rn plus 1 with the action of the orthogonal group, or uh, Again, the unit sphere in a complex space with the action of the unitary group. Uh, projective spaces, real complex, also quaternionic, but I will not introduce quaternions here. Um, the hyperbolic spaces with the action of the pseudo orthogonal groups, or unitary, pseudo unitary. And uh, I mentioned before the Heisenberg group, that's uh, an interesting object which uh, intervenes in. Uh, uh, as an interesting example in various parts of analysis nowadays. And uh, as a manifold, it is a CN times R, but with a product that is not, uh, that is not uh, the ordinary addition. And, um, and uh, this group is not commutative by itself, but if we consider the action of uh, the group itself by translation, but also unitary transformations on the CN space, then, then it becomes a commuted manifold. Okay. So uh, whether a manifold is commuted, it depends on the group which is acting on it. Um, in the, uh, I mean, if we have a Riemannian manifold, so a manifold which already has uh, a they define the Riemannian structure, then uh, there is a natural action of the isometry group, which is a big group. And, uh, and uh, uh, about this, I try to, to point out these interesting relations between the notion of commutativity with the other purely geometric notions. And uh, uh, so a Riemannian manifold is called the weakly <coughs> symmetric if given any two points, there is an isometry of the full manifold which flips the two points, each of the two the others. And uh, weak symmetry, now I'm assuming I'm disconnected, so weak symmetry implies homogeneity. And, uh, and it is a theorem that weakly symmetric and manual manifolds are So there are mm -hmm. A large number of them. If you're familiar with the notion of symmetric space, which is an even smaller class of all the Riemannian manifolds, then that, of course, is, uh, <coughs> is also uh, a class of, uh, of uh, commutative manifolds. Uh, so I've mentioned differential operators. I want. I need to say. I want to say something about uh, uh, integral operators. So just a notation. If we have a function on the manifold M uh, and an element of the group, we, we can think of, uh, uh, I mean, the, this element of the group also uh, acts uh, on the function by the <coughs> formula. So it means that you take the graph of the function and you move it according to the, to the, <coughs> to the action of, of this particular element. Uh, as I studied, so the integral operators, when I talk of integrals, I'm always referring to the gene variant positive or <coughs> measure that I mentioned. 
And then a linear operator which acts between two function spaces on any small G invariant if it commutes with all the translations. <coughs> with, with the action of the program. Uh, so, uh, I mean, an integral operator will uh, have a, an integral kernel, capital H, depending on the variables. And if I'm imposing the condition that it, uh, this operator commutes with the action of the group, this is equivalent to say that the function, the kernel H, satisfies that identity. If I apply an element of the group to both arguments, to both components of the argument, then the value of the function doesn't change. So now, as I said, we fix a base point. We take the stabilizer, g sub x0, we call it k for simplicity, and uh, we said it is compact, so k is a good letter. Uh, and then uh, if, we, if we pick uh, any element in the group, we know that uh, this x is g of x0 for some g. Uh, and then, uh, um, you see, if we take a capital H of xy, it, this is u of gx0 y because of the invariance property which I had mentioned before I can move g to the other component as a g inverse which means that uh, that this function of two variable can, is actually a function of a single variable can be thought of as a function of single variable this little h which is capital H of x not x and, uh, um, and this is not any function on M, because if you take an element in K, the stabilizer of X naught, then you can realize from the above formula that that this function little h is invariant under the action of K. So you have to think that if you think of the unit sphere, you have X zero, suppose it is the north pole, then the rotation that the elements of the orthogonal group which fix the north pole are the horizontal rotation of the horizontal plane, say. And then, uh, and then this, the north pole is fixed, but each of the other points of the sphere has an orbit, which is the parallel, okay? And, uh, and so it means that the, these functions um, h are, must be constant in the parallel, okay? So, uh, conversely, if we take a function h on the manifold, which is k invariant, so a function on the sphere which is constant on the parallels, then from this we can construct the, the integral capital H, and then and then we get an integral operator which has the g invariant. <coughs> And if, we, if you compose two operators which have this invariance, also the composition has it. And so if uh, you have h and h prime, the little h and little h prime, then uh, the composition yeah, has a, corresponds to a third h, which is given by that formula, which is, looks like a kind of convolution. It, it is a convolution once you lift functions on, uh, on the manifold to the group. Okay, but uh, that's, uh, I just keep accept that, that that kind of operation, that star operation that you see is associated as uh, all the good properties of the <coughs> of multiplication in an algebra. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, here, one important theorem. Um, I said, uh, we say that M is, uh, is commutative. I mean, the definition is that the differential of the G invariant differential operators commute among themselves. But it is equivalent to say that. Uh, is equivalent to require that the algebra of L1 k invariant function on M with the star product is commutative. So in a certain sense, I mean, for uh, integral operators that have the integral kernel L1 kernels, then uh, um, um, 
commutativity of the differential operator is equivalent to commutativity of the integral of the okay. And uh, well, of course, if you if instead of the manifold you have a topological space, then you cannot talk of differential operators, but you can still talk of integral operators. A nice group which acts it, and then and then uh, so this uh, second <coughs> characterization of, uh, of commutative spaces can be given of course in, in a more general uh, in the more general con context of uh, when, you have, when you have an open compact group system of and uh, a one with respect to which norm you are taking? Uh, well to the measure M has a has a gene variant. Okay, so that's the, the, yeah, it's always related to, to the G by the first thing, yeah. You, you can choose a constant, you can get scale but choose a constant. And so the, the term Gelfand pair, I said, which is a synonymous of, of commutative manifold, it, it, that term is used also in a non differentiable concept. Topological. There is a third uh, representation theoretic condition, I don't want to stress it because I'm not going to use it, which is involves the reducible unitary representations of the group G. That's a, 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 an important tool in the analysis, but, uh, but for the sake of this talk, this will not play, play uh, any, any, any role. So th there are two examples that I want to uh, describe. <coughs> In, uh, in detail, um, they are both, uh, in both cases, M is RN. Now, these are the first two that in, in my previous ones. But uh, I want to consider first the case where the group I'm considering is the transformation <coughs> group. And the second is uh, the case of the Euclidean motion. Translation. OK. So, um, so let's take an operator T. We want it to act with the, uh, to commute with the group action. So we want it to be essentially translation invariant. So what does this mean concretely when, when G is just the translation? Say. So for differential operators, it means that uh, we are talking of constant coefficient. Okay? So a constant coefficient operator, I can say, is a polynomial in the partial way. Um, what is an integrable operator? If you uh, <coughs> if you read what I written before in, the, in this context, it means that this function capital x y capital H of x y is the little h of x minus y, and so the the integral operator with this kernel little h of x x minus y is the convolution, it's the ordinary convolution of f with h. Okay? So the, transla the translation invariant integral operator of the convolution. Uh, now, let's go to the other situation. M is still Rn, but the, now the group also has rotation. So of course, if, you, if we have an operator which uh, commutes with all the elements <coughs> of G, in particular it commutes with translations. So what I said before applies, except that I now I have uh, further conditions to be satisfied. And then for differential operators, we cannot take all polynomials in the partial derivatives, but we are allowed to take only polynomial in the Laplacian. Okay? In this case, the Laplacian by itself is sufficient to generate all the all the invariant differential operator. And for integral operator, the condition is that the function in a, <coughs> we have a convolution operator with a little h, but this function little h must be derived, must depend only on the model x. Okay? And <coughs> with this, uh, I use this notation h flat to indicate. 
So it, the function h is defined on Rn, and the function h flat is defined on the defined on the non And uh, uh, well, we all know that in order, to, I mean, the, the basic tool for studying convolution operator constant coefficient the differential operator is the Fourier transform. Not only for that, but but I mean. The origin of this is, is just to treat the to treat in this case. And, uh, <coughs> and since we said that, that, for instance, let's take, I mean, in both cases, so let's say if T is a, is a differential operator or, or an integral operator, in both cases, um, <coughs> translation invariance can be, uh, condition can be can be subsumed by, by that fact that the, the operator t consists in taking the Fourier transform of the function f, multiplying it by a certain function, and then undoing the Fourier transform. For instance, for a differential operator, you take, you take the Fourier transform and you multiply by a polynomial, which is usually called the symbol of, of the differential operator, and then you undo the Fourier transform. Okay, so this M, which in one hand is called the multiplier, in, in the case of differential operator is the symbol. The uh, constant coefficient differential operator is, is the symbol. <coughs> and, uh, um, and there is a relation between the convolution kernel H and the multiplier M, say in the case of, a, of an integral operator and uh, and uh, this is that uh, the multiplier m is just the Fourier transfer of the function h and so this formula tells you how to switch so you, you multiply the exponentials and that, that gives you Fourier transfer and it's in it's um, well let me say I'm making this uh, uh, distinction between differential operator and integral operator just for talking of rather concrete objects and uh, I don't want to introduce distributions in this talk but if you allow the kernels uh, capital H little h to be distribution instead of uh, functions you can include uh, all of these operators together in the same family including the differential operators but, uh, but uh, I mean, not go into if we instead <coughs> If um, uh, consider the action of the whole uh, um, Euclidean motion groups also with rotation, uh, so we said f uh, uh, the function h is radial, then also its Fourier transform is going to be radial. So the multiplier m, which before in the case of just translation was the function of c1 cn again component of c. Now it becomes a function m flat of, of the modulus. <coughs> See again with m flat defined on the non-negative half line. And uh, uh, there is what is called the Henkel transform, which is it, it, it just a reformulation of the Fourier transform limited to, to, to radial functions. But uh, you see that uh, uh, now we no longer have exponential, we have uh, uh, now, J is a Bessel function. So you have, a, uh, here you have a function of lambda and x, actually of the little lambda and of x. <coughs> and uh, this function intervenes in both formula, the formula for h in one direction and the formula for <coughs> the, the inverse of h in the other direction. Uh, a little bit like the exponential before. There was a conjugation which here is not needed because, because this code is real. So in fact, that this is the analogy I want to point out between these two cases. In the case where we just take translations, the tool to, uh, <coughs> I mean the tool to pass to the multiplier m is, the, I mean the operator is the Fourier transfer. And uh, the Fourier transform involves multiplication, integration against the uh, against, uh, imaginary exponentials. Whereas uh, in, in the case of the full 
Euclidean motion group, you have the Henkel transform, and now you have this uh, modified Bessel functions. <coughs> okay, but uh, the important thing to notice, because what I want to do next is to extend this to general scalability manifests is the following, and this is important, that the imaginary exponentials are exactly the bounded eigenfunctions on Rn of joint eigenfunction of, of the partial derivative. So if you, if you apply each of these derivatives to this function, you are multiplying, if you take dxj, you are multiplying by ixj. So, so, and, and therefore, they are eigenfunction of all the constant coefficients. Right? Okay. <coughs> uh, well, oh, I said the bounded eigenfunctions of the scalar multiples, but I, I, I don't want to worry about scalar multiples. And these phi lambdas, these Bessel uh, uh, functions, Find they <coughs> are the, the bounded radial eigenfunctions of the Laplace. Okay, so remember, before I in the first case I had the n partial derivatives, which uh, generate all the cons all the, dif the relevant differential operators. In the second, I have one operator, the Laplace, and so these. Uh, uh, this uh, <coughs> Fourier and the Henkel transform are uh, integration against the, against the these And uh, uh, it's also important that all this will remain a little high hidden in, is that uh, the Fourier multiplier m or the Henkel multiplier um, is uh, um, also has a meaning in in uh, spectral theory because uh, because uh, in spectral theory one takes the self joint operators one defines the spectral measure and then uh, integrals with respect to the spectral measures and so it, w one gets to functional calculus on a single self joint operator or or uh, of a family of commuting self joint operators. And uh, so in the terminology of, uh, of uh, spectral theory, uh, if, if the operator T is associated to a multiplier M, then it means that, uh, that this operator is uh, a fun the function M of the M partial derivatives in the first case or the function and flat of the Laplace in, in, the second, in, in the second case. So, but uh, uh, this is a, another interesting connection. Okay, so uh, what do we do in the general case? What, what, what is true in the general case? So we take a, a general commutative manifold um, <coughs> then uh, there is an analog of uh, Fourier or Henkel transform, which, uh, and uh, and so it, 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 in order it, in order to to, to, to find this uh, analogy, we have to introduce uh, first of all what are called the bounded spherical functions. They are the bounded and the k-invariant eigenfunctions function, so all the differential operators that we need to achieve. Okay? Um, and normalized in order to avoid that. And then, um, um, but then we want to parameterize these functions nicely <coughs> and the natural thing to do is to take is to take a, a 
finite system of generators of the algebra of differential operators, like I had before the n partial derivatives, for instance, and uh, associate to the, to the eigenfunction phi the n tuple of its eigenvalues relative to these to this generators. So in this case, we represent the set of uh, of the bounded spherical function as a subset of, of Cn. And this, uh, and this is the set the sigma, which is also called the spectrum of, um, for, for, for this, for the community space. And then uh, the analog of the Fourier transform is the spherical uh, transform of so we must take a function h, which is k invariant of the manifold, and we <coughs> integrate it against the, the various the various spherical functions. And, and this gives us a function g of h, it's called the, the Gelfan transfer, uh, spherical transfer, and, uh, it, and this is defined in the set sigma. So, um, So, um, yeah, of course there is an arbitrarity in the choice of the generators, but this is uh, irrelevant. And uh, um, an important fact is that, uh, is that uh, this, uh, uh, which I anticipated before, this set sigma is with the topology induced by, by CM, CM is homeomorphic to what is called the, the Gelfand spectrum of the Banach algebra, of the L1 Banach algebra. And this means <coughs> that if one takes the set of bounded spherical functions, so several topologies coincide, what is called the compact open topology, the uniform convergence, the weak star topology induced from L infinity. And uh, the, uh, I mean, the Euclidean in quotes topology used by the identification of C. And, uh, um, and I must say this is uh, <coughs> uh, this last uh, uh, this last uh, uh, equivalence uh, of topologies uh, is not is not a classical fact. I, uh, in fact, I assigned to a student of mine, Fabio Ferrari Fina, several years ago, and um, I, I, I thought, I mean, it was, uh, it was uh, an exercise, then I realized that this didn't exist in the, in the literature. And of course, he proved it, so it, it is his result. And uh, the only trace I found of this is a partial, so it is only half of the, only one side of continuity. And, uh, and also only in the specific constant of symmetric spaces in the book about, uh, about uh, analysis on semi-simple groups. But uh, apparently, uh, this is a, a relatively new result. And as I said, this is one of the, of the properties that, uh, that uh, triggered my, this, um, this work that I, that I did since then. And uh, uh, the reason is that, that so you have uh, an abstract uh, topological space which comes from abstract theory. Uh, the fact that you can identify it with a subset of a Euclidean space with, uh, with induced, I mean, uh, you have a, a really concrete identification. But it, you can talk of smooth functions on this set. This is just a closed set. You, you may ask, so what happens if I restrict to this set a C infinity function? Uh, what, uh, so this function corresponds to, to a kernel H. What property does H have? You know, this, uh, uh, it opens up uh, um, a series of problems, which are the ones I And uh, I mean to um, 
to give you the idea that uh, the spherical transform and the Fourier transform have certain properties in common. Uh, here are, I mean, the, uh, the spherical transform transforms the, the star convolution into pointwise multiplication. Uh, it maps L1 into C0. Continuous functions vanishing at infinity. Uh, there is a uh, there is a Clancherel formula, so one can find the measure on the set sigma, measure nu, <coughs> for which one has uh, two identities between H and its uh, spherical transform. And then, uh, and then there is an inversion formula. You remember this? Without this lambda uh, going in the other direction, this without the, the conjugation, this is the formula for G. So G inverse also it involves the same spherical functions of the conjugation. Uh, okay, in the, in, in my title there is also the polynomial growth because if uh, we want to go further in, to analyze these analogies between, uh, between Fourier transform and the general spherical transforms, it's important to distinguish about two kinds of commutative spaces. Now, it turns out that there are two alternatives. Uh, well, let me say uh, these alternatives are in terms of growth of the volume of balls with respect to a certain distance. Now, it's uh, so the formulation requires that we introduce on the group G a distance. And a distance that is G invariant. Such a distance exists. There may be many distances that are G invariant. But uh, the conditions that I wrote do not depend on the choice of this distance. Okay? And so the two alternatives are that either the balls of radius R centered at any points, no matter grow polynomially, in fact a like a polynomial, or they grow exponentially, so that the, the log of the volume goes like a constant times. These are two separate words. If one takes, for instance, in the examples I gave at the beginning, uh, the only example of exponential volume growth is that of hyperbolic spaces. All the non-compact uh, symmetric uh, Riemannian spaces have exponential volume growth. Um, and uh, um, the, so the, 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 the message I want to bring is that polynomial growth is what uh, makes the analysis more similar to what we have in our end. So the spherical transform, the properties of the spherical transform, similar to that of, of the Fourier transform. Whereas for when the, you are in the exponential volume growth situation, things are, uh, are, are different. For instance, <coughs> uh, now, uh, I said uh, I said that the. Um, um, the spherical transform maps L1 into C0 of the spectrum C. Function, continuous function vanishing at infinity. Is it the Gelfand transform? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, in the, in the case of Fourier transform, we know that the image if you take Fourier transforms of L1 functions, they go into C0, and they give you a dense subspace of C0, an approximate C0 function. Fourier transforms of L1 functions. Um, this remains true in the case of polynomial volume growth. Um, for exponential volume growth, this is completely false. Because it, it is a fact that when you take the spherical transform of an L1 function, you have to see it embedded on, on Cn. 
then this has uh, some uh, holomorphic uh, extension to some larger domain. So, so it's um, or it has uh, some holomorphicity property I mean, even on sigma itself. So, so it's the The problems I'm, I'm interested in uh, are make sense make sense when one has polynomial volume, and uh, well, uh, there is a, a Wienberg structure theorem. I don't know this is this is for specialists of the groups, and I just want to be, uh, so it's. Uh, I mean, this is the so what group G can produce uh, can produce a, a a commutative a commutative manifold by quotient in modulo a compact subgroup. Then G must have this structure when n is nilpotent of step equals two. Uh, L is a reductive group containing containing K. Well, I, 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 okay, I, I just I just write it down. Um, and uh, and so this uh, one can deduce from this what is the situation when one can have polynomial volume growth, and this is when L is say essentially essentially compact. So it's, uh, I don't want to stay much. And so if we have polynomial volume growth. Uh, well, it's convenient to choose generators which are self-adjoint. You can always do that. Uh, find, find the generating systems which are self-adjoint. So if we take self-adjoint uh, <coughs> operators, then we can say that the spectrum is contained in Rn. So it's good that there is no complex structure on the same sigma. Uh, another good thing is that the support of the Plancherel measure is all of sigma. Uh, as I said, the <coughs> spherical transform of L1 uh, <coughs> functions is dense, is in zero. And also, the, the set sigma coincides with the joint L2 spectrum of the, of the operator. So everything matches with the natural spectral theory, so this <coughs> indicates how to do the, how to obtain the spectral decomposition of these operators. And uh, in the exponential uh, growth, here is what I was saying before, there are, uh, you have that spherical transform have contained some form of holomorphicity and, uh, and then you cannot have, for instance, this density in C0. Uh, and also the support of the Plancher measure is probably contained. And it differs from the L2 spectrum of the operators. So, so there are good reasons to separate, to separate these two cases. And uh, I would say the basic, the basic uh, problem I've been working on is, is uh, to find the analogs of this uh, fundamental property of the, of the Fourier transform, right? If we take Fourier transform on Rn, you know that the function is in the short space, that is infinity with the rapidly decreasing derivatives of all orders, if and only if its Fourier transform is a short function. This is very important, very useful, also analysis, etc. And uh, of course, there are analogous state torus. Uh, there is an analogous uh, statement for the Henkel transform. Um, it says that for f radial, f, f is Schwartz, if and only if the, the Henkel transform, which is defined on a half line, admits a Schwartz extension to R. But as far as this example is concerned with the Henkel transform, that's uh, a consequence. That's a, this is basically a consequence. Uh, now, on the groups with polynomial volume growth, first of all, it makes sense to define in an intrinsic way what the Schwartz function is. Because, of course, it's a manifold, so we know what C infinity means. 
And we can talk of polynomial, because volume of ball grows polynomial, we can uh, measure decay of a function both in terms of a, a, a given distance or in terms of, uh, I mean, compare with volumes of balls, as you go on, and, and, uh, and uh, decay more rapidly than any power n of the distance or the volume, etc., gives the same condition. So, and, uh, <coughs> and so, uh, one can define this in a uh, natural way. Okay, and uh, so this is on, um, <coughs> so this is rapid decay, but uh, yeah, yeah, in order to, to, <coughs> to define the short space, so let's say, um, I mean, one, we take a gene variant of Laplacian uh, with respect maybe to some Riemannian matrix, which is invariant. And then you require that all the power of the Laplacian of the function of this function uh, uh, decay rapidly. This tells you that the function f is in the short space. Uh, and now, on the other side, uh, on Rm, where we have the spectrum sigma, then uh, um, we define S of the spectrum as the space of restrictions of short functions on a okay? And so the, um, <coughs> the question is whether, I mean here, so the problem is validity of this double implication. This is the problem. I said for the Hegel and the Fourier transform, this is fine. What happens in, uh, in the general case? Now, uh, this program is not complete. I don't know. But I don't know if this is, this is uh, true. I mean, I know many cases where we have this, this um, equivalence. Uh, I don't know any example where this equivalence doesn't occur, but uh, I can see. It is always, it is always realized. Now, um, when you have uh, uh, the Euclidean motion group or other analogs of the, so with subgroups K, of, uh, you take some special groups, of subgroup of, of over rotation, then, uh, uh, then this, is, this follows from a theorem about, uh, I mean, a generalization of the Whitney representation theorem says that uh, if you take a C infinity function on Rn, which is invariant under a compact group, then it is a C infinity function of the fundamental invariant. So this is more the theorem in a real geometric algebraic geometry. <coughs> and uh, now, it is, uh, it is true in general when we have a polynomial volume growth, that if the spherical transform is Schwartz, so it's the restriction of the Schwartz function. So let's say you take a Schwartz function in Rm, you restrict it to sigma, and then you pass to the other side to get a function. Then this function is Schwartz. This function. Uh, so the problem is is in the opposite direction. Now, and, and this is a hard problem because the, this spectra sigma can have a rather complicated structure. For instance, this is the, uh, uh, this set of uh, half lines. I mean, here, uh, this dark half line is part of the spectrum, and there are infinitely many that cluster. So you have. Uh, I think you have uh, uh, angular coefficients which are plus or minus one divided by all the integers. And so you have this infinitely many times that plus or minus one. Uh, so uh, what is the other implication? You take a function on the group, which is invariant, and uh, you take the spherical transform. The spherical transform is defined only in this set. You have to. You want to prove that this extends to a short function, and uh, um, 
this is not so easy. This is not a set that is. Uh, there are there are uh, various works on extension of the Nikni extension theorem, and uh, but they do not apply it to this to this kind of set. And uh, um, so, in, and in any case, in this particular case, which is the Heisenberg motion group that I uh, mentioned at the beginning, um, we could prove uh, uh, by the method is that if you it, you have to start from this uh, from this half line and realize that this line is uh, is uh, you can it, you can understand that this is the same as the half line for the Hinkle trend and that when you restrict when you restrict your spherical transform to this half line you are exactly in the situation of the Hinkle. And so for that, we know that we have a short extension to the full line. But then uh, there is a way to obtain what is called a jet along this line. So to understand what, what would be the vertical derivatives along this line. Along this line, you can also obtain, uh, let's say, full Taylor development in the, in the, in the vertical directions. Uh, that's not enough because this uh, spherical, you, you don't want to have necessarily analytic functions, but, but that's already something that, that, that then allows to, to, to obtain the proof. But and here already one sees in germ the fact that, that in order to understand this complicated case, you must rely upon a simpler case, which is the case of the angle transfer. And from that, uh, uh, go. Uh, go some step further. And, uh, um, uh, and, and and that is the way that is the way that uh, led us uh, further and uh, but uh, you know one is to proceed it's, it's always it's a there is a, a, a lot of bootstrapping from simple situation into more complicated ones and uh, uh, we didn't get to, to the end yet. <laughs> enough, enough. Uh, I mean, it's not the case that one gets into it. Maybe <laughs> some point one, one, one will, will get it to, uh, to an end. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so uh, okay, I think I think I can stop here. I can stop here. Just maybe here. This is a, 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 a picture which so shows what what a, an example of another of another Gelfand spectrum. This is in three variable, but this is a, a, a three dimensional section of a four dimensional picture. And, uh, and so, yeah, here there are some results. This is. Uh, <coughs> We have got so far. Okay, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fulvio. Are there questions, comments? Why are you interested in this problem? What are the consequences? Well, it's. Uh, I mean, this analogy is, uh, <laughs> I find it interesting in itself. And um, also, if you, if you understand the, the, the Schwartz correspondence, then uh, uh, you can, uh, you have tools for more general operators. So that's a starting more analysis. But, uh, I mean, at this stage, I like it. It's, it's, uh, so why 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 should there be this analogy? Well, yeah. Or 
Present, for instance, in the example of that, like, in this picture. Yeah, in this picture. So, um, yeah, to mathematical physicists, uh, the second variable uh, is the Planck constant. And uh, so if you draw a horizontal line, the intersection mm -hmm. with this horizontal line mm -hmm. are the, represent the ground state for that uh, value of the planet. Mm -hmm. And the limiting case, uh, so the thick horizontal line mm -hmm. is the classical. Mm -hmm. Is the classical. Mm -hmm. OK, so. Uh, in a way, this may represent how, um, if there is a smooth uh, variation in terms of the plant constant, if you want. But it's not so, it is not. Um, this example also comes from complex analysis. Because uh, it's related to this situation where you take the unit sphere in, uh, in complex space with the action of the unit of the And then uh, um, and then in the analysis of the, so this is a model case for strictly complex domains. So the sphere, if you want, that's a compact case. It's called the single domain. And um, uh, yeah, so the motivations I know lead to examples for which we have the answers. Okay. <coughs> then uh, to, go, to go beyond that, I don't know. I mean, this, this classification. I uh, commutativity is a strong condition, but still leaves mm -hmm. a wide uh, family of manifolds. It, it is not clear that for all of them you can find, <laughs> you can find the physical mm -hmm. interpretation. No, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I agree. Okay. The spectrum of this light comes from which group? This is the Heisenberg group. That's manifold. Mm -hmm. And uh, the group acting is the left translations, which is, and the unitary rotations. And so the slopes correspond to the eigen values of the unitary rotations. No, the, the, they, uh, uh, they are the they are the eigenvalue of the harmonic oscillator. I mean, the Schrodinger representation. Uh, you have a, you have a kind of Laplace, and it's what is called the sub Laplace, which uh, which in the Schrodinger representation becomes the harmonics. So these are and these are and these yes. yes. Also, if you just take the Heisenberg group, uh, then the rotation, the space of the rotation consists of a Euclidean space 
time still lying, right? And uh, the flashable measure that you get there has to do with the, 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 the back measure of this line, I guess. Uh, so, so each value of this vertical parameter, so each value, let's say, of the plant constant gives you one representation. Yes. So, so the Plancherel measure. Let's say this is rather the joint spectral measure of the, of the two operators, the sub Laplacian and the center. Since those representations are important in quantum mechanics, I think this also answers the Yeah, yeah. yeah. And for the Heisenberg group, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have anything. <laughs> Any questions? We don't have anything. That general results about the size of the spectrum. As your example shown, the, size, the, the spectrum can be very small, for the general part of the spectrum can be just a point. So there are results about, general results about the size of the spectrum in this context. Size of the spectrum? Yes, yes. So uh, it tends to be a rather thin set. Yeah, yeah, the Plancherel measure is uh, tends to be similar. Half line, low dimension, except for, for, uh, for a very simple structure, it tends to be, tends to be higher. Just a curiosity. Um, is there, a, in principle, you can at least give a definition also for co compact groups? So I'm wondering whether some of these results can go to, instead of homogeneous action, we have a co compact action like we have a quotient that gives. A oh, oh an so you want to, you say the case where the quotient is compact? Yes, so the action is co compact and then I study an operator which yeah. are invariant means that Now, I, so I said at the beginning I want to assume that the stabilizers are compact. And there is a generalization of this theorem which doesn't impose that. So, for instance, if you, if instead of Riemannian manifolds, your stabilizers are compact. You take Lorentz manifolds or pseudo manifolds, then uh, then the stabilizer tend not to be not to be. And uh, and the, the, there is a there is a standard theory in that case. But uh, you have to be careful. I, I said there are three equivalent uh, conditions that define probability. Now, if you remove compactness of the stabilizers, they become different. And what is commonly used for commutativity is the one in terms of the reducing commuter representation. So the geometry tends to disappear with respect to the, <laughs> to the representation. Any question? Okay, so we thank you.